So microbiology is a study of all living organisms that are too small to be visible with the naked eye. This includes bacteria, viruses, fungi, and prions, collectively known as microbes. These microbes play key roles in nutrient cycling, biodegradation, climate change, food spoilage, the cause and control of disease, and biotechnology. Thanks to their versatility, microbes can be put to work in many ways, making life-saving drugs, the manufacture of biofuels, cleaning up pollution, and producing food and drink. Microbiology research has been and continues to be central to meeting many of the current global aspirations and challenges, such as maintaining food, water, and energy security for a healthy population on a habitable earth. With that said, we'd like to welcome Dr. Sean Scully on today's episode of The Universe is Made of Stories, Not Atoms. David Palandro, marine biologist. My name is Emma Stacy, and I'm a chemist. I am Dr. Asad Zidan, and I am a physiology professor. Hi, my name is Amman. I am a surgeon. My name is Istan Maharik. I am a dentist, and I work in Germany. Hi, my name is Evan Wesley, and I am the vice president for student activation for Third Project. Hello, uh, my name is Sarwat al I am a neurosurgeon and working in uh, Germany since eight years. Dr. Scully, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what a typical day at your job looks like? Sure. First and foremost, it's totally okay to call me by the first name, Sean. I live in Iceland where being on a first name basis, regardless of position, is the norm. So yeah, so a day at my job typically looks like uh, after getting up and getting my children to school, I usually come to the lab and the first thing I do is I check on my instruments. So downstairs where my laboratory is, we've got a fleet of analytical equipment that we use to analyze microbial fermentation products. So we use gas chromatography and high performance liquid chromatography. These are two of my favorite analytical techniques that we can basically feed in a solution of microbial fermentation products that contains like acetic acid, ethanol, lactic acid, and stuff like that, and actually quantify what our bacteria did in a given experiment. Usually after that, I usually head up to my office, check my email, which is not particularly exciting. And then if it's during the academic term, I usually teach somewhere between two and four classes a semester relating to microbiology and biochemistry and, and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. So as we did um, background research, we noticed that you have a few research papers on thermophilic bacteria. So there's this one paper called Progress in Second Generation Ethanol Production with Thermophilic mm -hmm. Bacteria. So what about thermophilic bacteria is so special that you chose to really delve into it? Well, well, that's a great question. So when I was a kid, I, one of the family vacations we went on took me and my sister out to a Yellowstone with my mom and my dad and we went camping. And uh, we sort of drove around South Dakota. And one of the places we stopped was Yellowstone National Park, which is famous for its hot geysers and hot springs and stuff like this. Unfortunately, I was too young at the time to sort of fully appreciate, you know, how cool those environments were from a microbiology standpoint. I was more interested in the fact that, you know, you're standing on top of a giant volcano. But when I eventually moved to Iceland, I sort of realized that there was a lot of microbiology that's kind of been ignored. We typically look at life as, you know, something that happens at ambient temperature. But there are a lot of microbes that, you know, thrive in low temperatures and also very high temperatures. And Iceland is, of course, full of these environments where you find thermophilic microorganisms. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And what really struck me was how similar thermophilic microorganisms are to so-called mesophilic microorganisms. So the things that kind of live at the like near room temperature. So there are microbes that can survive, you know, above the boiling point of water. And they're made out of the same basic building blocks that you and me are made out of. Proteins, DNA, fats, sugars. And a lot of their proteins and DNA molecules are actually very similar to ours with a few minor tweaks that actually allow them to thrive at these higher temperatures. So I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. So I kind of ended up, you know, going down this path of playing around with these warm, loving microorganisms. Yeah, that's um, really interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about what thermophilic bacteria are, you know, like what benefits they can provide in this field? Sure. Or is it just like, yeah, you're just like exploring to know more about them? Yeah, so first of all, a thermophilic microorganism is any microorganism that grows optimally above 50 degrees centigrade or higher. 
and some of the benefits that they have are kind of a little bit counterintuitive. So one of the big benefits to using thermophilic microorganisms for bioprocessing is that they don't require as extensive heating and cooling costs as a lot of mesophilic bioreactors. So for instance, if you want to grow up like E. coli to make a protein or whatever, usually one of the largest costs associated with growing microorganisms like normal bacteria in large scale is the fact you need to heat the culture up to, let's say, 37 degrees. Then you need to make sure that, that the temperature stays in that very sort of narrow range. With thermophiles, in a lot of cases, you actually need to heat them to 50 degrees or higher, sometimes 65, 70, 80 degrees is an unheard of. But on the back end, you don't have to worry about cooling them as much because, you know, you can take advantage of sort of the natural cooling of, you know, the evaporation of water to sort of help regulate the bioreactor temperature to make sure that things stay at the right temperature. So it's a little bit less energy intensive in that regard. There are two other major benefits that I think are kind of interesting. The first and the second benefit, I should say, is that as you heat up water and you dissolve a bunch of stuff in water, you can get more stuff dissolved in hot water than cold water. And what are the consequences of the higher temperatures also? Solutions of like, let's say if you make a sugar solution, it's going to be a lot less viscous at high temperature than at low temperature. Yeah. So if you're trying to pump stuff around between tanks and bioreactors and stuff like this, in a lot of cases, it's more easily done at high temperature. The third major benefit is a lot of reactions tend to progress more completely at high temperature just because of thermodynamics. So as you increase temperature, reactions go more to the right. And it's important, especially if you're trying to make really simple molecules like hydrogen, carbon dioxide, ethanol, and acetic acid, because those are fairly simple molecules and they tend to be very far to the right of a lot of these biological processes. And that sounds like a really interesting discussion. I, I was curious about one more thing about thermophilic bacteria. Do you think that their a smaller size or like, you know, micro size helps them survive in such hot temperatures and extreme temperatures? Absolutely. So one of the benefits of being really small is that you can be more efficient. So one of the problems that us eukaryotic organisms have is we've got really large cells. So things like exchanging nutrients and gases across that membrane are oftentimes limited because the amount of surface area of a cell is very large compared to the volume of the actual cell. So you've got kind of a weird surface area to volume ratio. When you're smaller, a lot of these exchange processes are more efficient. So that's one benefit to being a microorganism. And a lot of thermophiles actually tend to be a little bit on the smaller side compared to their normal, well, normal mesophilic counterparts. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, we've learned a little bit about that in AP biology, about like the surface area to volume ratio of like cells and all that stuff. So that makes sense. Okay. So for our next question, we were wondering if you could expand upon the relationship between biofuels and microbes. So how can microbes help alleviate global warming and like the human carbon footprint? Oh, definitely. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, I, I would like to point out our species has been making biofuels for a very long time. So we've been using yeast to make ethanol for, I don't know, several millennia at least. But a lot of people don't realize that we've actually been making other biofuels since at least the start of the 20th century. So during the First World War, um, there was a huge demand for uh, acetone to produce smokeless gunpowder. It's called cordite. And uh, there's a class of organism called class Clostridia, which contains the genus Clostridium. And a lot of Clostridium species are really good at producing things like acetone, butanol, and ethanol. And during World War I, the Americans and I think the British were producing large scales of butanol and acetone on an industrial scale to provide enough solvent to produce cordite for the war effort. Now, at that point, butanol was basically a waste side product. Nobody really knew what to do with it, but it turns out butanol is actually a really efficient biofuel. It has a very good energy density. It's less volatile than ethanol, which makes it a little bit safer, and it's just sort of a well-rounded biofuel. Also, during the early 20th century, there's a lot of effort put into this idea in the United States, you know, which grows a lot of corn. And people can actually take their own corn and basically basically hydrolyze the starch and ferment it to ethanol so they could actually use ethanol as a fuel for driving vehicles. Unfortunately, this idea didn't really gain traction in the early 20th century because there was, you know, all of a sudden this sort of flux of petroleum resources, which was abundant and inexpensive at the time. Yeah. So I think those are two beautiful examples of how, you know, microbes can sort of help us sort of produce alternative biofuels that we can use to sort of step away from petroleum products. And there are a bunch of other examples. So one of my other favorite examples, there's a thermophilic bacterium called Caldicellulose eryptor. And the name, if you actually sort of break it down, literally means hot cellulose breaking bacteria. 
And what this microbe can do is it actually it can actually ferment cellulose from grass and stuff and convert it to hydrogen, which is another really potentially useful biofuel. Okay, yeah. So how exactly are microbes used to make biofuels and bioplastics? So typically the process is fairly straightforward. So assuming you're starting from a raw material, usually in the lab when you're screwing around, usually you start with a really simple material like glucose or sucrose, sometimes lactose, and you basically feed it into a bioreactor that contains your microorganism that does the fermentation and it produces your biofuel. Then it's just a matter of sort of separating either the plastic or the ethanol or butanol or hydrogen from the fermentation vessel. In the case of hydrogen, that's pretty straightforward because it's a gas. But usually more often than not with a lot of biofuels, what you need to do is you need to separate the biofuel from the water that's in the fermentation vessel. Usually that's done by distillation. There are a few other techniques you can use, but usually distillation is sort of a go-to technique. Now, if you want to start from something that's a little bit more convenient, like let's say starch, or cellulose or hemicellulose or even seaweed, you now have an added problem. So a lot of the organisms that you use to produce biofuels or even bioplastics don't break down the really large molecules that you find in complex biomass. The organisms that break down starch and cellulose and xylen and some of the other things that you find in biomass typically aren't the same set of organisms that are really good at producing biofuels. So in a lot of cases, what we'll do is you'll take an enzyme produced by a fungus like Trichoderma ricei. It's one of these white rot fungi. At least I think it is. I should, that's something I should know, but oops. Um, but you take the enzyme, you add it to the biomass, basically convert it to sugars. Then you take that hydrolysate, that sugar mixture, and then feed that to the bacteria to produce the biofuels. That's a pretty fascinating process, actually. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Okay, can you tell us about your current project called Next Generation Biofuels from Protein-Rich Biomass? Sure. So what, one of the things that we're trying to do is uh, when I was working on my PhD, I did a project, instead of studying the fermentation of sugars, I studied the fermentation of proteins and amino acids, which is a little bit different. And one of the things that came out of this project was a lot of the thermophilic bacteria that I'm working with can actually not only ferment proteins and amino acids, but they can actually convert fatty acids like acetic acid or propionic acid or butyric acid to their corresponding alcohol. So you can convert butyric acid into butanol or acetic acid into ethanol. Well, that was a little bit more challenging. So one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to take protein-rich biomass, break it down into amino acids, and then convert those amino acids to fatty acids and alcohols so we can use those alcohols as a liquid energy carrier. Yeah, okay. Um, so I get one follow-up to that. So where can we get waste protein from? Because protein, I mean, that's normally something you want to put on people's dinner tables. So do we really want to use protein to produce biofuel? I mean, maybe, no. I mean, we need, we need it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we, we need it. This kind of comes back to the same problem that countries like Brazil have experienced. Because, I mean, Brazil shifted to an ethanol-based economy like back in the 80s, I think. But their ethanol all comes from starch, or mostly comes from starch. Yeah. Well, if you start using starch-rich foods or foodstuffs to produce biofuel, what's going to happen is that the cost of food is going to increase. And we've seen this in the United States as well. Oh, and so you can kind of talk yourself into a similar corner with protein. So the trick is to use things that aren't being used as food to produce these biofuels and even bioplastics. So my hope is that by using some waste material from like, let's say fish waste okay. or slaughterhouse waste, we can basically sort of take those scraps that are destined for the garbage dump and convert them into something that's a little bit more useful rather than just letting them rot in a landfill, for instance. Yeah, that makes sense. And it would also like get rid of the, you know, possibility of like a food shortage or something. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So for our next question, we were wondering if you could talk about the difference between first and second generation biofuels. And do you work with both as a microbiologist? Sure. So first generation biofuels are typically biofuels that are produced from so-called first generation biomass. So first generation biomass is basically any biomass that's easily fermentable to stuff, whether it's lactic acid or ethanol or acetic acid. So things like sugarcane, which is rich in sucrose, corn, which is rich in starch, those are classified as first generation biomass. 
Second generation biomass and by extension, second generation biofuels are produced from things like lignocellulosic biomass. So wood pulp, tree branches, horn husk. And the second generation biomass is composed of predominantly cellulose, usually some hemicellulose and lignin. Yeah. So the benefit, of course, of second generation biomass is that, you know, we can't really eat second generation biomass. I mean, we can eat it, but it doesn't really digest in our digestive tract. So it doesn't directly compete with food, which is nice. And uh, do you work with both as a microbiologist or just like second generation biofuels? Oh, not only do I work with both first and second generation, I've actually started working with so-called third generation biomass, which are things like macroalgae. And I'm also working with so-called next generation biomass, which is waste materials, waste streams. And uh, just to clarify, like is second and third generation biofuels derived from first generation biofuels or are they just like different ways to categorize different biofuels? Yeah, they're just different ways to categorize the biomass that goes into making different biofuels. Oh, okay. okay. So third generation biofuels are typically those organisms which are algae. So either microalgae or macroalgae, so like seaweed. Okay. And then another question that we had, because like upon our research, we found that microbiology and like microorganisms helps with making certain like medications. Like there was an interesting fact that we read that said that microbiologists have contributed to some of history's most important scientific breakthroughs, like the smallpox vaccine and, yep. you know, the cause of flare and all that stuff. So we're just wondering, like, do you work with doctors or, you know, those involved in the medical field to make medicines like not directly since you're not like a doctor, but do you kind of help them with certain things? Unfortunately not. Closest I come is I do work with some microorganisms that cause diseases in humans. There are a couple of opportunistic pathogens I work with just because they're cool microbes and they do useful things like make bioplastics or some other useful molecules. That said, some of the molecules that my research group is focused on making are actually starting materials they can use to make drugs. So you guys are in AP bio. Are you guys also taking AP chemistry by any chance? Yeah. Okay. So have you heard of this concept called chirality in chemistry? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just for the listeners. So in a lot of cases, we've got complex molecules. You can actually have two different arrangements or multiple arrangements in three-dimensional space. So you can have like a right-handed form of a molecule and a left-handed form. Some of the microbes that I work with are actually really good at sorting out the right and left-handed forms of different molecules. And when you're making like pharmaceutical drugs, you want to make sure that you're working with molecules that are either just the right-handed form or just the left-handed form. So one of the molecules that my group is really interested in making is a very simple molecule called 1,2-propanediol. If you ever look at shampoo bottles, it's sometimes listed as propylene glycol. What's interesting about this molecule is it's a simple molecule that has a right-handed form and a left-handed form. And some of the bacteria that we work with are actually really good at producing just the right-handed form or just the left-handed form, which is something that's very difficult to do chemically. So while I don't have any direct links to either pharmacology or actual medical professionals, there are some subtle connections. Yeah, okay. I mean, like the, like your, I guess, aspect or focus in microbiology is still very interesting. Yeah. So we wanted to kind of talk about more of your career now because we have been kind of focused on the science aspect. So what's the most interesting or your most favorite part of your job? Oh boy, that's a, <laughs> that's a really loaded question. I'm going to try to answer with just a couple things. So it's hard to pick up one thing that's like my absolute favorite part of my job. So on the teaching side of my job, I really enjoy talking to students and just sort of getting to see firsthand their curiosity about a subject. I love it when students ask stupid questions because usually they're not stupid at all. Usually they're, they're questions that sometimes I don't even know the answer to, which is awesome. Yeah. I just really kind of enjoy watching that process of you know curiosity and just asking questions and trying to find answers. So that's one thing that I really enjoy about the teaching side of my job. On the research side of my job, I really enjoy going down to the lab and actually just doing stuff with my hands. I love, you know, I've always loved chemistry and, you know, I've kind of fallen in love with microbiology kind of as an accident. But I love going down to the bench and actually like designing experiments and actually doing research and, you know, finding things that are interesting and unexpected. Because, I mean, if you didn't expect it, then you didn't think to ask a, an interesting question. And yet nature shows you that, oh, there's something here that's interesting and worth looking at. Yeah, yeah. Those are probably the two aspects that I really enjoy. They're, they're related. They both kind of correlate to this idea of curiosity. Mm -hmm. 
And to follow up with that, what would you say is the most difficult part of your job? Oh boy. On the teaching side, sometimes dealing with students can be challenging because, you know, I mean, anytime you're dealing with a human being, there are always inherent challenges. It's rewarding to sort of be able to help students overcome those challenges and actually get to the thing that we're trying to achieve, which is learning. So that can be a challenge. On the the science side, I think the big challenge is that there are only so many hours in the day. I've probably got more questions than I'll ever be able to answer in my lifetime. So that's a major hurdle. The other challenge, I think, is the process of applying for money. So laboratories are pretty expensive to actually, you know, run instruments and buy chemicals and stuff like that. And the process of applying for money and getting told no is a really challenging experience. So that's definitely something that is not particularly enjoyable. Yeah. Okay. And then like just out of curiosity and just for people who are more interested in maybe becoming a microbiologist, can you tell us how did you get interested in becoming a microbiologist? And I guess what made you interested in studying like microorganisms rather than larger ones? So it's actually a funny story because I did not set out to become a microbiologist. It just kind of happened by accident. So I actually view myself as more of a chemist. I went to university with the intention of becoming a chemist. But at some point, I realized that there's a lot of chemistry, especially a lot of organic chemistry that we can actually do with microbes and their enzymes. And it kind of led me down this path of, well, why don't we do more chemistry with microorganisms and their enzymes? And at the time, this was in the early 2000s, and a lot of people were just kind of starting to wake up to this idea of green chemistry and stuff like this. So it really wasn't on people's radars. And then when I moved to Iceland, having basically successfully avoided microbiology up until moving to Iceland in 2008, I was found myself all of a sudden surrounded by people that were doing microbiology. And I'm like, oh, that's actually kind of interesting. And it was kind of new. And so I, I took a couple of courses in microbiology and found out that it was really interesting. And my chemistry background was very, very helpful to understand sort of what was going on at the molecular level. And I just found myself quickly falling in love with this topic because, you know, I could put together two things that I love, you know, microbiology and using really small organisms to do the chemistry of life and get them to do maybe that they don't want to do, but you can get them to do by just sort of tweaking the culture conditions and the way in which you kind of grow them and give them specific things to degrade. Yeah. I think that's going to be like really reassuring, honestly, for student viewers and also coming from me, because I feel like a lot of students feel like whatever you do in college is kind of like it's decided for life. But like you kind of shown that you can change and it's fine and, you you know, you'll still be happy with it. Actually, I think that's a really big problem with our education system. Yeah. Um, You know, I think we give a lot of students this sort of false idea that like, you know, you kind of like go down this particular track and that's that's it. You know, it's it's once you start down the path to study medicine, that's it. Or once you start down the path of becoming studying business, that's it. But, you know, in the real world, like there's actually a lot more opportunities to sort of move between disciplines. And there's actually a lot of benefit, you know, studying one discipline and then migrating over to something else. It kind of gives you a unique perspective. Exactly. Compared to people who sort of start down this like really ultra narrow path. Right. So this is kind of a follow up um, to what you said about initially being a chemist. So if you weren't a microbiologist right now, what would you be? Would that be a chemist or? Probably. I mean, I think at the end of the day, I'd probably end up doing very similar things. I'd probably be asking very similar questions and trying to do the same types of things just with a different toolbox. Right. One last question, just out of curiosity. Do you yourself like collect the microbes that you're you know, going to be studying or like are they brought to you and you just simply study them? The answer is both. So for the first part of my career, I basically only worked with microbes that other people had collected. Mm -hmm. It turns out that when you go out and collect microbes for the particular purpose in mind, it's called bioprospecting. So in 2013, I actually went out to some hot springs for the first time and actually collected environmental samples, brought them back to the lab, and basically spent the next three months with a team of three other undergraduate students working with me to actually isolate a couple hundred different microbes in pure culture from those environmental samples. So typically what you do when you're working with microbiology is if you go out and collect your own microbes and you figure out what they are, more often than not, what you'll also do is you'll also purchase microbes from a culture collection to use as sort of a reference for your experiment. So that way you can demonstrate to somebody who's reading your work that, oh, okay, this person's doing this interesting thing with a microbe that I don't have any way of getting, but they're also doing the same interesting thing with something that's closely related to it that I can actually go purchase from the American type culture collection or Germans have a culture collection called DSM. So usually you do kind of a mixture of both. 
A lot of microbiologists that I collaborate with elsewhere in the world, they only work with microbes that they either purchase or are given to them by other microbiologists. So at least in our group, what we do is we do kind of a fair amount of going out to interesting environments and collecting microbes and bringing samples back to the lab for analysis. Yeah. I think we've come to the end of this episode. We just wanted to say thank you so much for offering your time to talk to us about your field of study. I'm sure you've inspired many of our ASD students who are thinking of going into STEM. So thank you so much for coming on here. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I hope our viewers enjoyed the conversation. It was very interesting to hear like more microbiology things rather than macrobiology, if that's an actual term. Uh, no, it is. I've used it. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's an actual thing, but I often use the phrase macrobiology. Yeah. Okay. Everything else. So. Is it a real term? That's a good question. I actually don't know. I, I pretend like it's a real term. So. I, mean, I feel like it would make sense if it was a real term. Like we have micro, we have to have my, macro. <laughs>